Kia ora, warm greetings to you. My name is Pritika. I'm here to talk about family violence intervention in the primary care sector. Um, and I'm talking to you because you hold the power to make a change. Today I'm here looking for change makers and at the end of my presentation I will provide you my contact details. I would like you to contact me and let me know either way whether you would like to be a change maker or not. And, and that's fine, either, either is absolutely fine. It is entirely your decision. Um, so before I start, just by a show of hands, how many of us are GPs in this room? Wow, that is a very large number. And nurses? Midwives? Any profession I've left out or you are here and I've not asked? Pharmacists? Awesome, thanks for being here and thank you so much for giving up your Saturday for this um, health symposium today. Um, how many people have daughters in the room? You've got daughters. How many people have granddaughters? <laughs> this is fantastic because um, I, as you'll discover in the next couple of minutes, I don't have a hardcore presentation as such. I'm running a quiz. I've got only eight questions because I knew I'm the first, first speaker after lunch and I, I know that your sp stomach is focusing on digestion or storing the food until it digests. I did, you know, I remember biology from high school days. <laughs> So I'll do a bit of a quiz, but the one thing I want you to remember is that the change makers I'm looking for, it is not exactly about you or me in the room today. This is about your daughters. Because one in three women in New Zealand is affected by domestic violence. Um, roughly, can someone throw a number at me? How many women would be in the room roughly here today? Just a number, I know we can't count an exact. 96? Divide 96 by three, I'm not good at maths. <laughs> 20, 32, I told you I'm not good at maths, but now I've got your attention. So 32, so the, uh, if, I, if I apply that research findings to the people in this room, if there are 96 women in this room and one in every three is affected, 32 women in this room, right here, right now, today, are affected by domestic violence and I could have been one of them. I'm doing a really good job at hiding it because I'm being a professional right now and I'm supposed to deliver a presentation and not supposed to talk about it. That is the harsh reality of New Zealand, which is why I say this is about your daughters because if one in three women is affected, it could easily be your daughter or my daughter that is affected by this um, domestic violence problem. Now I'll quickly talk about SHINE. How many people have heard of SHINE before? Fantastic, I don't need to go through this slide. Um, those of you who haven't heard about SHINE, we've got two refuges in Auckland, but we work very closely with the Nation National Collective of Independent Women's Refuges. So um, we do that service. We've got an adult crisis team that works with women. We've got a kids SHINE program that works with children. We provide four free psych assessments for children who have been impacted by domestic violence. We run a men's program, which is is a 20 or 22? I think it's 22 weeks men's program, behavior change program, where our clients are referred to us by the Ministry of Justice. All of the information on this slide is available on Shine's website. Our men's program is called the No Excuses program. And then we've got our training systems at policy and advocacy team, which I am part of, which means we go out and do presentations and training sessions for health professionals and any other professionals who want to talk more about domestic violence or find out how to set systems in place to address the domestic violence issue. I won't go into definition because I want to launch straight into the quiz. Now the rules of the quiz are, I know you've already started reading the first question, that's fine. Rules of the quiz are we will use the popcorn method to answer. You know when you apply heat to a pot, corn start, start popping from all places. So, there's, so just shout out the answer if you want to or, you know, so we're using the popcorn method. So question one, in New Zealand, and you can mark yourselves if you want to. I know some people like competing with themselves, which is perfect. <laughs> in New Zealand, approximately how many family violence situations are police called to every day? A? So for those of you who said A, 
I have shocked you even before I begin this presentation. The answer is um, B, 301. Now last year, in the 2015 calendar year, New Zealand police responded to 101,114, 101114 cases, um, call outs of domestic violence. And the research and police say that they only ever get to hear of 20% of what the real situation is because more than half the time domestic violence goes unreported. Question two, in a New Zealand study, what is the number of women who experienced at least one act of physical or sexual violence by an intimate partner in their lifetime? Okay, how many say B? C? D? When I started the presentation, I said one in three. <laughs> But this is a study uh, done by Dr. Janet Fonslow. I think you would have heard her name. She is a lecturer based here at Tamaki Campus. Um, if you, uh, her name is Janet Fonslow, and she did this study. Her two study sites were Auckland and Hamilton. It was done in 2004, but the findings are relevant. Now, what's shocking is that if you include, so the question includes physical or sexual violence by an intimate partner. If you add emotional and psychological abuse by an intimate partner, the answer goes from A to B, one and two. So it's shocking. The numbers are, I think, 39% to make that one in three figure, and it's 55% to make that one in two figure. Question three. Children who are directly abused rather than those who only witness domestic violence are more likely to show more severe impacts on their health and well-being. True. Children who are directly abused. So there's no difference whether a child has witnessed domestic violence or whether they have experienced domestic violence, the impact on children is the same. There's no different. You can't say, Pratika was beaten severely when she was a child, but this child here, Anita, only witnessed it and she should be fine. There's no difference between Pratika and Anita. If anyone's name, named Anita in the room, <laughs> we are siblings now. <laughs> what I'm showing you is um, scans, a brain, uh, is um, photos of a child's brain, and as you can see, the one on the right is the temporal lobes are not as developed as the one on the left. So we know from research that sustained neglect, stress, and trauma to children, um, it, it puts people in a space where stress hormones are released, and when stress hormones are released, then um, Higher functioning of the brain is impaired, and that involves neurodevelopment and cognitive development. So that is why the development of the brain on the right-hand side in the picture has been inhibited because of the release of stress hormones in a child. And this sort of brain development sets a child on the back foot for the rest of their life because their brain has been damaged from a very young age. And this study, you will find it on www.nzfamilies.org.nz slash research children, healthy families, young minds, and developing brains. So this is a New Zealand study that I've got this information from. How many of you have heard or know about the ACE study? Awesome. Um, so ACE stands for Adverse Childhood Experiences. Um, this is a now th this is a very long study, so I'm going to read um, highlights of it because there there are a lot of notes. Um, so more than 17,000 health maintenance organisations or HMO members undergoing a comprehensive physical ex examination chose to provide detailed information about their childhood experiences of abuse, neglect, and family dysfunction. So basically, what this pyramid is telling is on on the right, sorry, to, to my left there, is that two out of three people participating in this study reported at least one condition of adverse childhood experience, and more than one out of five reported four 
um, adverse childhood experiences. And what is ACE? It is either psychological, physical, sexual, or sexual abuse, or violence against their mother. So they must have witnessed violence against their mother, or living with substance abuses, mentally ill or suicidal parents, or parents that were ever imprisoned. So those are the things that count as adverse childhood experiences. So I couldn't say that all of this is related to domestic violence. However, there's been correlation found that the larger the number of people that experience ACE, adverse childhood experiences, the more likely their risk is for the other conditions in this pyramid to um, have a alcohol or drug use issue or to have a smoking problem or have multiple sexual partners or uh, higher up um, on the pyramid, they are more likely to be suicidal, have severe ob obesity, liver disease, STIs and depression. So that is how important it is to have a happy, healthy family environment in early years of life so that there's less likelihood of a person to grow into and develop those um, um, habits which are risk factors of other diseases, other chronic illnesses. Now, questions, any questions for the first three questions? You're with me? I've got eight questions only. So question four. The international estimated co-occurrence of child physical abuse and partner abuses. Yes, popcorns. B? There's a strong inclination for B and C. OK. B is the answer. Now, it depends on which study you are looking at. I've got at least three references here in my notes. So if you were looking at Hester and, and uh, his colleagues in 2000, or, or you could be looking at Elderson and their colleagues in 1999, and Humphreys and to Hiara in 2002. It depends on which study you were looking at. You'd find a number between 30% to 66% for this answer. Question five. This is a question which is my personal favorite from the quiz. In an Australian study, domestic violence is responsible for more ill health and premature death in women. 15 to 44 years, than any other of well-known risk factors, including illegal drugs, drinking, high blood pressure, obesity, and smoking. All of those conditions combined, and family violence on one side. For me to put it in the quiz, it had to be true, right? <laughs> I gave it away. Had to have some easy ones. I request you to look at the graph. I'm not going to talk much to it because I know that you are very capable of reading this graph. It's, this was a study done by Victoria Health in Melbourne, and I deliberately put the reference at the bottom of the graph because, like I said, this is my personal favorite information. I was shocked when I found this out last year only. I know the study was done earlier in 2004, but I came across this information just last year. If, if this information interests you in the end when I give, give you my contact details, please say hi and ask for the information that you want or get in touch with Sue and I can share the, a PDF of my presentation, no problem. Right, so I think I'm missing a question. I told you I had eight questions, so I'm going to read out my next question. In a New Zealand research, which was conducted in 2014, how many child homicide victims were known to child, youth, and family at the time of their death? Oh, sorry, your answers are 82%, <laughs> 68%, um, or 46%? I have, I have succeeded in shocking you, haven't I, if you said 82 that strongly? The answer is 46%. 46% of victims were known to child, youth, and family. So what happens is when a child is dead, here is the dead child. This is the parents of the child who died. This is the family and friends of the parents of the child that died. This is relatives, neighbors, family, and friends of families and friends 
of the parents of the child that died. And this is us. Shine service providers, midwives, doctors, police, sis. But who is blamed for this first? Whereas the child that died was so far removed from us, unless there was a complaint made. But I know of one sector that saw all of these children before they died, at some point in their lifetime. Which was that sector? It was us, right? The health sector. They were born at one of our hospitals. They came to one of our clinics. Their mom came at some point in her pregnancy. They saw one of our midwives. And, and we saw them through the birthing process and before they went home. So we saw those children and we saw those mums. <clears throat> I know my job does get sad sometimes when I read the, all this reality. Now, question seven is a money question and I'll give you three options. What do you think the economic cost of domestic violence is to New Zealand? Your options are 100 million, 3 billion or 7 billion? 100 million, 3 billion, or 7 billion? The answer is C, it's 7 billion. And this is from the Glenn Inquiry, which was conducted in 2014. Um, there are other studies, um, other researches done on other diseases. In 2008, it was found that di type 2 diabetes called caused 60 million, um, COPD caused 192 million, um, dementia costed 436 million, um, that was in 2008, and arthritis in 2004 costed 564 million. But domestic violence in 2014, the Glenn Inquiry found that it costs 7 billion to New Zealand. So, I started this conversation with you saying that I'm here to find change makers. Now, 50 years ago in the early 1900s, if someone said that there will be a time when people of black skin, African Americans or Indians, would be able to sit in the same cafeteria or restaurant as white-skinned colonizing communities, that would have been a distant dream. Would you agree with me? There were a lot of barriers. The barriers were the mindsets of community, um, traditional thinking or, or dominant cultural thinking at the time, and that was just a no-no and a taboo. But it took change makers to effect that change. New Zealand and smoking, not too long ago, I, I am a migrant here, I haven't been here more than 10 years, but 20, 30 years ago, if somebody said New Zealand is going to become smoke-free, wasn't that a distant dream? There was the hospitality industry, all the taxes that we gained from cigarettes and uh, restaurants, the retailers association. Wasn't there so much, so many barriers to, so many hoops to jump through? But look at where we are now, where we are today. Look at the achievements of the public health sector or, or the health sector in general. Therefore, I'm here talking to you about asking for change makers. This was, so the Ministry of Health in 2002 um, implement, uh, not implemented, uh, released the first family violence intervention guidelines, which states some basic questions, four questions, um, to ask women as they come in to your clinic. And there's um, three, or three questions to ask about their children. So it's child abuse and neglect and intimate partner violence guidelines, and that is combinedly called the Family Violence Intervention Guidelines. It's, um, uh, anyone can Google, I mean, anyone can go to the Ministry of Health website and see these guidelines, and some of you are probably aware of it. What has changed this year is that since the guidelines were released in 2002, in June this year, just five months ago, the guidelines were revised. So I think it is timely that we looked at our practices and what we are doing in order to help women and children experiencing domestic violence. And um, the slides that I jumped through, which I won't go through, is what, why, how this can be done at your clinics. Um, simple answer is contact me because ADHB has contracted Shine and employed me to help clinics and primary care organizations where there are change makers who stand up and say, okay, enough is enough. That girl walking in through the door could be my daughter with my granddaughter sitting in front of her GP and there's one chance 
to find out that she's experiencing domestic violence and give her appropriate support. Yes, it's a health issue and it is a social issue. Why don't we why do we want to have a robust healthcare response? Is because if we have a healthcare response, we will know that we have tested, we have trialed out the referral agencies, and we know that they work. We are not leaving them to untrained people to give counseling or advice as people in the community often try to do when they find out about domestic violence. If there was a system set up in place at your clinic, you would know which agency you were referring to. They had qualified people to deal with it, such as Shine or other agencies. And you'd know that your patient was held safely. So th that is what I'm here to talk about. I was here to talk about. Right. So call Shine. Pratika S at twoshine.org.nz. And before you ask me, no, the program is not funded. Ministry of Health recommends, but there is at the moment no funding set aside for PHOs. Unfortunately, my position is so further down that I'm in no position to um, influence any money attached to the screening, but then there are GP clinics around Auckland who are screening, and they say that they can't not screen because of the impact, health impacts of domestic violence is so large, is that they say it's too expensive not to. Could you please mention the results um, fully Absolutely. So with this um, um, VIP program, DSEC, Doctors of Sexual Abuse Care, provide free intimate partner violence training, and Dr. Kalash Diva is one of the trainers, so feel free to contact her. Um, and Te Puaruru Ho, um, Dr. Patrick Kelly and his team provide free four hours child abuse and neglect training. So there's free training available as well. There's free training, and if you fall within the ADHB area, there's my role to come to your clinic and, and, and support your practitioners with their capacity building around screening for domestic violence. I have gone probably two minutes over, but thank you for your time. <laughs>